Welcome to the HR Stories Podcast, listener question edition, where there is a lesson in every story. Each week, the team at HR Stories Podcast shares questions from our podcast audience and provides tangible, practical advice that everyone can use to get HR right. Our hosts today are management and HR consultants, Chuck Simikian and John Tallheimer. What is on your mind today? Welcome to the team at HR Stories, HR Stories podcast, where there is a lesson in every story. Today we're talking, we're having the questions edition. So hopefully you're turning in to listen to us. We are in the questions edition of HR Stories podcast. Good morning, Chuck, how are you? I am fantastic. I am fantastic. I know it doesn't sound fantastic, but I, I feel great. I feel great. It's, um, I love this portion of our HR Stories podcast offering where we take these questions and we give our thoughts and opinions. This is not legal advice. However, it uh, may be for your entertainment value, perhaps, um, and educational <laughs> value too. <laughs> All right, I don't know about I don't know about for your entertainment value, but it is informative. It's info yes. infotainment, right? And that's why we're here. Uh, I love that you kind of reminded everyone that look, this is not going to be legal advice because we don't know everything, right? And so uh, Chuck and I do a lot of workshops, and in the beginning of the workshops, we're always like, look. We don't know all the details, so we can't give you legal advice. We're going to give it based on generic, hey, best things. And so today we have four questions, Chuck, um, that I want to start in. I want to dive right into them and go into them. Are you ready for question number one? Bam. I'm looking ready to, your to go. Yeah. Well, I, I like could... having fun. That's the one thing about us. We like having a little fun, keeping it light. A lot of times HR can be very heavy, so but we keep it serious. So what's our question? We keep it serious. We have it fun, we keep it serious. I'm not right All right, uh, here's the first question. Uh, so this is from one of our listeners, and Dang. she or he, I don't know which, uh, said this, I've recently joined a small family owned company that has little to no HR. So far, it looks like the files were kept in order. Good. It's a very paper oriented company, not much digitally, right? Not much digitally. This is the first for me to be on a team of one. So this person is an HR team of one and, mm -hmm. have, and have no processes in place. Any advice where you would start putting processes in place? And so, Chuck, the real question underlying all this is like, hey, I'm, I'm new to uh, handling HR for a department of one. Where should I start? Where should I focus my energy on first? What should I do first? Yeah, so I guess we're saying the files are in order. So you've already done and, and looked at that. Yeah, it's a tough question in the way that not knowing enough info on the size and company and, and things like that. But taking your question at face value, um, I'm gonna say, first of all, the fact that it's a paper company is no big deal because in all reality, you wanna have processes in place uh, in paper. And then if you wanna move to electronic or something, you can. But the important thing is, um, you know, have processes. So just, Throwing it out there, John, I'm thinking definitely, all right, so a couple of processes I would put in place. No, no right or wrong answer, just some processes. Number one, I would make sure there is a recruiting process, right? Um, in other words, some way to track job openings, job closings, approvals, applications, resumes, uh, tracking your, you know, who you're offering jobs to, having a job offer letter, having consistent um, letters or, or a way to inform candidates that you are moving or are not moving forward with them. But I would focus, first of all, on a recruiting process, get that consistent. Okay. That's that's first thing. Second thing is I would probably as you know so many processes but I I'm thinking of a um 
an exit process. You want to take a look at the, the, and not so much the exit process, but a process for, and I know we don't like using this word as much, but that employee uh, discipline, coachings, counselings, and maybe if you have to, ultimately some sort of termination, but having a process that's consistent, right? That's why you want to have a process for dealing with coachings, counselings, and terminations, because uh, that will go a long way, not only in protecting your company, obviously, but in efficiency. So you didn't mention anything about a handbook, so you want to make sure you get a handbook together because that's going to uh, help you with process creation. And the only other thing I can think of, John, the third process is to put in place, if they have 15 or more employees, or if you have, as a uh, questioner, if you have 15 or more employees, you need to have in place a, a process for sexual harassment. Uh, training your employees, training your managers, and most importantly, definitely a process in place to uh, for employees on what to do to complain or make a concern, uh, bubble a concern up on any type of harassment or sexual harassment. So those are things that come to mind when I read this question. Yeah, I, I love that. I love that way you were kind of thinking through that. For me, because you mentioned it, the employee handbook to me would be the first place I would start, right? Because mm -hmm. when we go in, we're new to an organization, the employee handbook is going to give us some hints and some understanding of how the company is being run, where they are in their policy. Is there a lot of policies or are there no policies? Um, and that will really do that. The other thing that I also would really probably want to do is having early on conversation with my boss or the owner of the company and ask, how will you know that I'm successful? What, what do mm -hmm. you want me to focus on first? And it may be, oh, I need you to focus on the administration, the recruiting, the exit interviews, the performance management, the administration, the I-9s, payroll, all that stuff and making sure that's up to date. Or they may be like, look, our culture sucks here and I need mm -hmm. you to focus on that. So again, getting guidance from above is going to help going, okay, this is what I need to focus on. But I think all of this needs to be done. I just think you really want to pick one thing, focus on that, get that right, and then move on and do that. You can't do everything at once. And I think a lot of times as Department of One, we'll come from an organization that had all these things in place and bottom. and we had more than one person and that kind of stuff. And it seems like, oh, we need to do that here. You can't, right? You're going to need to focus on things. Employees are going to come to you with issues and that kind of stuff. And you need to go, okay, <clears throat> I got 50 hours a week. Where am I going to focus my time and do that and kind of narrow it down? And that's going to be, as Chuck said, it's going to be individual for your company. So that was a good, good question, Chuck. Yeah. All right. And I just want to throw out one more thing you you said is you cannot and you didn't say it here, but you've said we've said it. Enough, <laughs> you can't do HR in a vacuum. So get with your. Yeah, that's right. I love that. Get with your. I was just throwing out processes, but I missed the most important thing that you brought up. Get with your <laughs> boss, the owner of the company or something and ask them what processes need to be in place. Do you think, boss, to make us more efficient and start there? Good point, yeah. John. Yeah, and then I mean, obviously you're going to advise them because you have the expertise and human resources. So you may like, I know you think that uh, the company pop, uh, picnic is really important, but that's probably low on our low hanging fruit. Let's start with the big stuff and let's get down in there. All right, so question number two, and this is a what would you do? So this is from Jennifer. And Jennifer says this, employee calls off and uses unexpected vacation time for personal issues for the first part of the work week. Then he, it's a he, is a no call, no show for two days and then drops off his company property at our facility and not saying a word to anyone. He just, and we discover the property hours later and reach out and the employee then confirms that they quit. Would you pay for the vacation time. So they've quit on you, but they took two days, I think it was, of vacation time. Yeah. Okay. Well, here's my thought. Uh, that would depend. I'm going to go back to two things, your policy and 
and probably your state law. So um, it depends on what your policy is. Uh, if your policy is combined PTO and vacation and sick pay um, that employees can use at any time uh, that they want to, then yeah, you probably would pay it out if that's what your policy says. But if your policy is like, hey, you used vacation time employee that no call, no showed and quit. And our policy is you have to give a week or two weeks notice to have vacation time approved and they did not, then I would not uh, pay it out. Uh, also, I guess I'm thinking you want to check what the state law is, if there's any obligation that you have to pay out any accrued vacation, no matter what. OK, yeah. some state laws have that. And but absence of of any policy or state law, you literally could do whatever you want. So, no, you don't have to pay it out. Um, you but that would really end up being to on your end professionally i certainly understand and personally why you would not want to pay it out and you probably won't have to at least within uh if you're within your legal boundaries yeah that's funny because my reaction is just pay them just pay them <clears throat> just get it over with just pay them just let them go and don't be make a big deal about it um but after i say that i started thinking about all right well if i do that for them What's the ramification down the road? Now, are other people going to go, well, you did it for John, so now you have to do it for Julie and Chuck and, right, and Jose, right? And so you have to be really careful when you're making these decisions, right? Chuck's right. First thing is what, for me, first thing is what does your state law say, right? And most likely mm -hmm. your policies are going to be based on state law. So, again, and then you look at your policies, and then without any of that guidance, then you really have that there. And so, but when you're making that decision, right, Jennifer, when you're making that decision, I would be thinking about, all right, if I do it for this person, am I going to continue to do that going forward? Or if I don't do it for this person, am I going to continue that going forward? And so this really yeah. comes down to, and I think the important thing that I would stress is having good policies up front so you're not in those situations, right? And so you know, hey, this is what our policy is. So. Yeah. And John, I just want to add a lot of policies will say you cannot use vacation or PTO in lieu of two weeks notice. So a lot of times people will say, well, I want to give two weeks notice, but I want to use one week as vacation. And then I'll, you basically get wow. one week of work for me. If, if you have a policy like that, you definitely do not have to pay this out also. So good. Yeah, that's, good points. That's, yeah. That's funny because we had a policy. I worked in manufacturing and we had a policy. If you gave your two weeks notice, that was your last day. <laughs> yeah, because we had a lot of, we were working with high um, confidential military stuff. And so we didn't want them around that um, if that was the case. Um, and then we would pay them for the last two weeks. We'd pay them. We're like, all right, mm -hmm. boom. And that, but everyone knew that. And so the employees would come in on Friday and then start their new job on Monday, but they would also get two weeks of pay from us. But that was yeah. just, that was the way we worked and that was fine. All right, so third question, Chuck. This is from Tanya. What is your role? So what is your role as the human resources professional in, perform in annual performance evaluations? I'm a new HR generalist at the company and looking for recommendations on how I can add value in the performance management area. Sure. Okay. So as in the HR role, when it comes to performance evaluations, a lot of times I view the HR um, role almost like the orchestra conductor. Okay. The orchestra conductor, making sure everyone is doing what they should be doing, when they should be doing it, that they're doing it correctly, and that everyone is in sync. OK, the great orchestra conductor, HR person. So the HR person uh, should be making sure the performance reviews are in line with 
the company values and they and they make sense. HR role should be to make sure the process is in place uh, and it's clear and the managers are notified that performance reviews are due, that the, the HR role is to make sure that managers are trained and know how to do a proper evaluation. And, um, and then I would think finally the HR role should probably be to, to review the final, whether it's before the employee, it's delivered to the employee, or maybe shortly afterwards, just to make sure there's no discriminatory content to review the final document. And then, of course, the HR role is to make sure the review and the compensation matrix uh, are correlated together. So that's where I see that the great conductor of HR when it comes to employee uh, performance evaluations. Yeah, I like that vision of that, like conducting and doing that. I have two things that I would add is I think it's um, I love that. Um, Two things I would add is communication, right? And so I th you talked about it, Chuck, right? And so our job in HR is to communicate out to all the employees, it's time for your annual performance review. Please make sure you do your self-evaluation. Managers, this is when the first draft of the employee performance review needs to be to your boss so it can be reviewed. And then ma you know, managers of managers, this is when everything needs to be done and committed to um, there, right? So this is what it needs to be HR, blah, blah, blah. Communicating that timeline out and sending reminders. And the second word I would use is consistency, right? Creating that mm -hmm. consistent pattern of how we are doing it for our organization, right? And so setting that up and doing that, that kind of stuff. I think a lot of times we spend way too much energy on annual performance reviews and we get into all these details and all that kind of stuff. And I think that um, those annual performance reviews should be quarterly. There should be quarterly part of that. So we know like, oh, this quarter you did this, this is great. And so you can do it. Um, but setting up that function, I, I agree with what a lot of what you said, Chuck, kind of doing that on there and being that conductor, cool. right? Not that training conductor, but the symphony. Conductor. <laughs> right. The symphony oh, conductor. Yes. All right. So we got a bonus question to this week. Ooh, bonus uh, yeah, question. I thought I'd throw one in there. And this one's a little, this may be a little out of our scope, Chuck. So feel free to say, John, I have no idea. That's that's fine. Uh, so this person, I didn't get the person's name, works in a pediatric office. And four out of the five physicians are partners. Are they considered employees? where only the one who is not an owner is considered an employee. Do I count them as part of our 15 employees? And frankly, why does it matter? Yeah, I, I, I'm just gonna say, I think it depends how the company is maybe set up, but the way this question is, and I'm gonna say, I don't know for sure, but the way this question is set, I don't think partners, ownership partners, may or you know, I don't know. I don't think they would qualify as employees, but once again, it depends on how the organization is ultimately uh, set up. What do you think, John? Yeah, I, I think there's two There's two things we need to think about, right? And so um, we need to think about it from the, how the company is financially set up, right? How is it, how is it perceived by the IRS in terms of, is it a sole proprietary ship? Of course not, right? Because they have four partners. Is it a partnership, right? Is it a C corp? Is it an S corp? My guess from what I'm reading here is that this is a partnership set up. So it's not a C corp. It's a not an S corp. It's an LLC partnership that's set up. In that case, the employee owner, um, the employee, the em owners are responsible for debt and income. And they're not employees, right? And so kind of looking mm -hmm. at it that way um, would be my guess. Again, we don't have enough details, unfortunately, to kind of dive into this. But the other thing that I would ask you to think about is it may be different depending on which agency you're talking to. Right. Right. And so we're thinking about, okay, well, we know that um, the Americans with Disability Act starts with 15 employees. I would check with the Department of Labor, 
Like this is the way we're mm -hmm. set up, this is our structure. Do I count that? Now, look, here's my feeling. If I was your consultant, uh, and whoever this is, if I was your consultant and you asked me this, I'd say, look, as far as you're concerned, Americans with Disability Act, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, you're following them. You're not gonna be like, eh, we're not gonna get with them. You're gonna follow those for all of your employees. Now, for tax purposes uh, and paying, it's gonna be different, right? And so um, I would lean towards counting just whether, it, you know, you're, go you're going from 16 employees to 12 employees based on four partners, I'm just following those things anyway. Um, yeah. and so again, doing that, but then you get into a lot of taxing. This is where your CPA and your employment lawyer are gonna really help diving, get into there and really understanding that. So again, not having enough information, we can't make that decision for you. But what I would do is one, talk to the owners and go, okay, how are we set up? Cause that's gonna depend on whether we treat you as employees or not. Uh, and then talking to an employment lawyer and going, hey, this is how they're set up. Is there anything we need to do to make sure we're doing that right? Yeah, I love it. So, yeah. So those are our four questions. That was a great episode. Um, any final thoughts, Chuck? Anything that's kind of catching at you at this very moment? I know we're in November. We're getting close to Thanksgiving. Anything maybe we should be thinking about in terms of holiday parties? Yeah, holiday parties. We've got a great class coming up about um, holiday parties and things to keep in mind for setting up those holidays. There's all kind of legal landmines and and potholes that you need to to keep in, in mind. And we've got year end things coming up, checklists, keep your checklists up to date. We have our ultimate uh, guide to HR checklist book. And you know, when the, the one person asked about the policies and the processes, I'm thinking you probably need a couple of good checklists. So go to hrchecklist.com and check out our book, the, the ultimate guide of HR checklists. John, that's all I, have to, that's my that's final great. words. That's great. Yeah. Well, thank you for listening, everyone. You've been listening to the HR Stories podcast, where there is a listen, there's a lesson in every story, and there is an answer for every question. Thank you so much for listening today. Thank you for listening to the HR Stories podcast. The material presented in this podcast is for informational purposes only. Chuck and John always recommend using an employment lawyer or HR consultant to handle any legal concerns or HR issues. We do our best to double check sources and make sure the information we are providing is accurate. We may eliminate or embellish without changing the basic narrative to make the story easier to understand. In certain circumstances, we may change identifying information to protect the innocent. The HR Stories broadcast is brought to you by the team at HR Stories. The team at HR Stories is designed to help anyone with HR responsibilities be better at managing the employee experience. To engage with us, go to the hrstoriesteam.com and learn more about how the team at HR Stories can support your business or nonprofit. Thank you for listening to the HR Stories podcast, where there is a lesson in every story.